Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 12. The Deserted House, by Ernest Theodore Amadeus Hoffman, Part 1. They were all agreed in the belief that the actual facts of life are often far more wonderful than the invention of even the liveliest imagination can be. It seems to me, spoke Lelio, that history gives proof sufficient of this, and that is why the so-called historical romances seem so repulsive and tasteless to us. Those stories wherein the author mingles the foolish fancies of his meager brain with the deeds of the great powers of the universe, Franz took the word. It is the deep reality of the inscrutable secrets surrounding us that oppresses us with the might wherein we recognize the spirit that rules, the spirit out of which our being springs. Alas, said Lilio, it is the most terrible result of the fall of man that we have lost the power of recognizing the eternal verities. Many are called, but few are chosen, broke in France. Do you not believe that— an understanding of the wonders of our existence is given to some of us in the form of another sense but if you would allow me to drag the conversation up from these dark regions where we are in danger of losing our path altogether up into the brightness of light-hearted merriment i would like to make the scurrilous suggestion that those mortals to whom this gift of seeing the unseen has been given remind me of bats you know the learned anatomist spallanzani has discovered a sixth sense in these little animals which can do not only the entire work of the other senses but work of its own besides ho oh, ho oh, laughed edward according to that the bats would be the only natural-born clairvoyants but i know some one who possesses that gift of insight of which you were speaking in a remarkable degree because of it he will often follow for days some unknown person who has happened to attract his attention by an oddity in manner appearance or garb he will ponder to melancholy over some trifling incident some lightly told story he will combine the antipodes and raise up relationships in his imagination which are unknown to every one else wait a bit cried lelio it's our theodore of whom you are speaking now and it looks to me as if he were having some weird vision at this very moment see how strangely he gazes out into the distance theodore had been sitting in silence up to this moment now he spoke if my glances are strange it is because they reflect the strange things that were called up before my mental vision by your conversation the memories of a most remarkable adventure oh tell it to us interrupted his friends gladly continued theodore but first let me set right a slight confusion in your ideas on the subject of the mysterious you appear to confound what is merely odd and unusual with what is really mysterious or marvellous that which surpasses comprehension or belief the odd and the unusual it is true, spring often from the truly marvellous, and the twigs and flowers hide the parent stem from our eyes. Both the odd and the unusual and the truly marvellous are mingled in the adventure which I am about to narrate to you, mingled in a manner which is striking and even awesome. With these words Theodore drew from his pocket a notebook, in which, as his friends knew, he had written down the impressions of his late journeyings. Refreshing his memory by a look at its pages now and then, he narrated the following story. You know already that I spent the greater part of last summer in X. The many old friends and acquaintances I found there, the free, jovial life, the manifold artistic and intellectual interests, all these combined to keep me in that city. 
i was happy as never before and found rich nourishment for my old fondness for wandering alone through the streets stopping to enjoy every picture in the shop windows every placard on the walls or watching the passers-by and choosing some one or the other of them to cast his horoscope secretly to myself there is one broad avenue leading to the gate and lined with handsome buildings of all descriptions which is the meeting-place of the rich and fashionable world the shops which occupied the ground floor of the tall palaces are devoted to the trade in articles of luxury and the apartments above are the dwellings of people of wealth and position the aristocratic hotels are to be found in this avenue the palaces of the foreign ambassadors are there and you can easily imagine that such a street would be the centre of the city's life and gaiety i had wandered through the avenue several times when one day my attention was caught by a house which contrasted strangely with the others surrounding it picture to yourself a low building but four windows broad crowded in between two tall handsome structures its one upper story was little higher than the tops of the ground floor windows of its neighbors its roof was dilapidated its windows patched with paper its discolored walls spoke of years of neglect you can imagine how strange such a house must have looked in this street of wealth and fashion looking at it more attentively i perceived that the windows of the upper story were tightly closed and curtained and that a wall had been built to hide the windows of the ground floor the entrance gate a little to one side served also as a doorway for the building but i could find no sign of latch lock or even a bell on this gate i was convinced that the house must be unoccupied for at whatever hour of the day i happened to be passing i had never seen the faintest signs of life about it an unoccupied house in this avenue was indeed an odd sight but i explained the phenomenon to myself by saying that the owner was doubtless absent upon a long journey or living upon his country estates and that he perhaps did not wish to sell or rent the property preferring to keep it for his own use in the eventuality of a visit to the city you all the good comrades of my youth know that i have been prone to consider myself a sort of clairvoyant claiming to have glimpses of a strange world of wonders a world which you with your hard common sense would attempt to deny or laugh away i confess that i have often lost myself in mysteries which after all turned out to be no mysteries at all and it looked at first as if this was to happen to me in the matter of the deserted house that strange house which drew my steps and my thoughts to itself with a power that surprised me but the point of my story will prove to you that i am right in asserting that i know more than you do listen now to what i am about to tell you one day at the hour in which the fashionable world is accustomed to promenade up and down the avenue i stood as usual before the deserted house lost in thought suddenly i felt without looking up that some one had stopped beside me fixing his eyes on me it was count p whom i had found much in sympathy with many of my imaginings and i knew that he also must have been deeply interested in the mystery of this house it surprised me not a little therefore that he should smile ironically when i spoke of the strange impression that this deserted dwelling here in the gay heart of the town had made upon me but i soon discovered the reason for his irony count p had gone much farther than myself in his imaginings concerning the house he had constructed for himself a complete history of the old building a story weird enough to have been born in the fancy of a true poet it would give me great pleasure to relate this story to you but the events which happened to me in this connection are so interesting that i feel i must proceed with the narration of them at once when the count had completed his story to his own satisfaction imagine his feelings on learning one day that the old house contained nothing more mysterious than a cake bakery belonging to the pastry-cook whose handsome shop adjoined the old structure 
the windows of the ground floor were walled up to give protection to the ovens and the heavy curtains of the upper story were to keep the sunlight from the wares laid out there when the count informed me of this i felt as if a bucket of cold water had been suddenly thrown over me the demon who is the enemy of all poets caught the dreamer by the nose and tweaked him painfully and yet in spite of this prosaic explanation i could not resist stopping before the deserted house whenever i passed it and gentle tremors rippled through my veins as vague visions arose of what might be hidden there i could not believe in this story of the cake and candy factory through some strange freak of the imagination i felt as a child feels when some fairy tale has been told it to conceal the truth it suspects i scolded myself for a silly fool the house remained unaltered in its appearance and the visions faded in my brain until one day a chance incident woke them to life again i was wandering through the avenue as usual and as i passed the deserted house i could not resist a hasty glance at its close curtained upper windows but as i looked at it the curtain on the last window near the pastry shop began to move a hand an arm came out from between its folds i took my opera glass from my pocket and saw a beautifully formed woman's hand on the little finger of which a large diamond sparkled in unusual brilliancy a rich bracelet glittered on the white rounded arm the hand set a tall oddly formed crystal bottle on the window ledge and disappeared again behind the curtain i stopped as if frozen to stone a weirdly pleasurable sensation mingled with awe streamed through my being with the warmth of an electric current i stared up at the mysterious window and a sigh of longing arose from the very depths of my heart when i came to myself again i was angered to find that i was surrounded by a crowd which stood gazing up at the window with curious faces i stole away inconspicuously and the demon of all things prosaic whispered to me that what i had just seen was the rich pastry cook's wife in her sunday adornment placing an empty bottle used for rose water or the like on the window-sill nothing very weird about this suddenly a most sensible thought came to me i turned and entered the shining mirror wall shop of the pastry cook blowing the steaming foam from my cup of chocolate i remarked you have a very useful addition to your establishment next door the man leaned over his counter and looked at me with a questioning smile as if he did not understand me i repeated that in my opinion he had been very clever to set up his bakery in the neighboring house although the deserted appearance of the building was a strange sight in its contrasting surroundings why sir began the pastry cook who told you that the house next door belongs to us unfortunately every attempt on our part to acquire it has been in vain and i fancy it's all the better so for there is something queer about the place you can imagine dear friends how interested i became upon hearing these words and that i begged the man to tell me more about the house i do not know anything very definite sir he said all that we know for certainty is that the house belongs to the countess s who lives on her estates and has not been to the city for years this house so they tell me stood in its present shape before any of the handsome buildings were raised which are now the pride of our avenue and in all these years there has been nothing done to it except to keep it from actual decay two living creatures alone dwell there an aged misanthrope of a steward and his melancholy dog which occasionally howls at the moon from the back courtyard according to the general story the deserted house is haunted in very truth my brother who is the owner of this shop and myself have often when our business kept us awake during the silence of the night heard strange sounds from the other side of the wall there was a rumbling and a scraping that frightened us both and not very long ago we heard one night a strange singing which i could not describe to you it was evidently the voice of an old woman 
but the tones were so sharp and clear, and ran up to the top of the scale in cadences and long trills, the like of which I have never heard before, although I have heard many singers in many lands. It seemed to be a French song, but I am not quite sure of that, for I could not listen long to the mad, ghostly singing. It made the hair stand erect on my head and at times after the street noises are quiet we can hear deep sighs and sometimes a mad laugh which seem to come out of the earth but if you lay your ear to the wall in our back room you can hear that the noises come from the house next door he led me into the back room and pointed through the window and do you see that iron chimney coming out of the wall there it smokes so heavily sometimes even in summer when there are no fires used, that my brother has often quarrelled with the old steward about it, fearing danger. But the old man excuses himself by saying that he was cooking his food. Heaven knows what the queer creature may eat, for often, when the pipes is smoking heavily, a strange and queer smell can be smelled all over the house. The glass doors of the shop creaked in opening. The pastry-cook hurried into the front room, and when he had nodded to the figure now entering, he threw a meaning glance at me. I understood him perfectly. Who else could this strange guest be but the steward who had charge of the mysterious house? Imagine a thin little man with a face the color of a mummy, with a sharp nose, tight-set lips, green cat's eyes, and a crazy smile his hair dressed in the old-fashioned style, with a high toupee, and a bag at the back, and heavily powdered. He wore a faded old brown coat, which was carefully brushed, grey stockings, and a broad, flat-toed shoes with buckles. And imagine further that in spite of his meagerness this little person is robustly built, with huge fists and long, strong fingers, and that he walks to the shop counter with a strong firm step smiling his imbecile smile and whining out a couple of candied oranges a couple of macaroons a couple of sugared chestnuts picture all this to yourself and judge whether i had not sufficient cause to imagine a mystery here the pastry cook gathered up the wares the old man had demanded wait out wait out honored neighbor moaned the strange man as he drew out a little leathern bag and sought in it for his money i noticed that he paid for his purchase in worn old coins some of which were no longer in use he seemed very unhappy and murmured sweet sweet it must all be sweet well let it be the devil has pure honey for his bride pure honey the pastry cook smiled at me and then spoke to the old man you do not seem to be quite well yes yes old age old age it takes the strength from our limbs the old man's expression did not change but his voice went up old age old age lose strength grow weak oh -ho! and with this he clapped his hands together until the joints cracked and sprang high up into the air until the entire shop trembled and the glass vessels on the walls and counters rattled and shook but in the same moment a hideous screaming was heard the old man had stepped on his black dog which creeping in behind him had laid itself at his feet on the floor devilish beast dog of hell groaned the old man in his former miserable tone opening his bag and giving the dog a large macaroon the dog which had burst out into a cry of distress that was truly human was quiet at once sat down on its haunches and gnawed at the macaroon like a squirrel when it had finished its tidbit the old man had also finished the packing up and putting away of his purchases good night honored neighbor he spoke taking the hand of the pastry cook and pressing it until the latter cried aloud in pain the weak old man wishes you a good night most honorable sir neighbor he repeated and then walked from the shop followed closely by his black dog the old man did not seem to have noticed me at all 
i was quite dumbfoundered in my astonishment there you see began the pastry cook this is the way he acts when he comes in here two or three times a month it is but i can get nothing out of him except the fact that he was a former valet of countess that he is now in charge of this house here and that every day for many years now he expects the arrival of his master's family my brother spoke to him one day about the strange noises at night but he answered calmly yes people say the ghosts walk about in the house but do not believe it for it is not true the hour was now come when fashion demanded that the elegant world of the city should assemble in this attractive shop the doors opened incessantly the place was thronged and i could ask no further questions this much i knew that count p's information about the ownership and the use of the house were not correct also that the old steward in spite of his denial was not living alone there and that some mystery was hidden behind its discolored walls how could i combine the story of the strange and gruesome singing with the appearance of the beautiful arm at the window that arm could not be part of the wrinkled body of an old woman the singing according to the pastry's cook story could not come from the throat of a blooming and youthful maiden i decided in favor of the arm as it was easy to explain to myself that some trick of acoustics had made the voice sound sharp and old or that it had appeared so only in the pastry cook's fair distorted imagination then i thought of the smoke the strange odors the oddly formed crystal bottle that i had seen and soon the vision of a beautiful creature held enthralled by fatal magic stood as if alive before my mental vision the old man became a wizard who perhaps quite independently of the family he served had set up his devil's kitchen in the deserted house my imagination had begun to work and in my dreams that night i saw clearly the hand with a sparkling diamond on its finger the arm with a shining bracelet from out thin gray mists there appeared a sweet face with sadly imploring blue eyes then the entire exquisite figure of a beautiful girl and i saw that what i had thought was mist was the fine steam flowing out in circles from a crystal bottle held in the hands of the vision o oh, fairest creature of my dreams i cried in rapture reveal to me where thou art what it is that enthralls thee ah i know it it is black magic that holds thee captive thou art the unhappy slave of that malicious devil who wanders about brown clad and bewigged in pastry shops scattering their wares with his unholy springing and feeding his demon dog on macaroons after they have howled out satanic measure in five eight time oh i know it all thou fair and charming vision the diamond is the reflection of the fire of thy heart but that bracelet about thine arm is a link of the chain which the brown-clad one says is a magnetic chain do not believe it o oh, glorious one see how it shines in the blue fire from the retort one moment more and thou art free and now o oh, maiden open thy rosebud mouth and tell me in this moment a gnarled fist leaped over my shoulder and clutched at the crystal bottle which sprang into a thousand pieces in the air with a faint sad moan the charming vision faded into the blackness of the night when morning came to put an end to my dreaming i hurried to the avenue and placed myself before the deserted house heavy blinds were drawn before the upper windows the street was still quite empty and i stepped close to the windows of the ground floor and listened and listened but i heard no sound the house was as quiet as the grave the business of the day began the passers-by became more numerous and i was obliged to go on i will not weary you with the recital of how for many days i crept about the house at that hour 
but without discovering anything of interest none of my questionings could reveal anything to me and the beautiful picture of my vision began finally to pale and fade away at last as i passed late one evening i saw that the door of the deserted house was half open and the brown-clad old man was peeping out i stepped quickly to his side with a sudden idea does not councillor binder live in this house thus i asked the old man pushing him before me as i entered the dimly lighted vestibule the guardian of the old house looked at me with his piercing eyes and answered in gentle slow tones no he does not live here he never has lived here he never will live here he does not live anywhere on this avenue but people say the ghosts walk about in this house yet i can assure you that it is not true it is a quiet a pretty house and to-morrow the gracious countess s will move into it good-night dear gentlemen with these words the old man manoeuvred me out of the house and locked the gate behind me i heard his feet drag across the floor i heard his coughing and the rattling of his bunch of keys and i heard him descend some steps then all was silent during the short time that i had been in the house i had noticed that the corridor was hung with old tapestries and furnished like a drawing-room with large heavy chairs in red damask and now as if called into life by my entrance into the mysterious house my adventures began the following day as i walked through the avenue in the noon hour and my eyes sought the deserted house as usual i saw something glistening in the last window of the upper story coming nearer i noticed that the outer blind had been quite drawn up and the inner curtain slightly opened the sparkle of a diamond met my eye oh kind heaven the face of my dream looked at me gently imploring from above the rounded arm on which her head was resting but how was it possible to stand still in the moving crowd without attracting attention suddenly i caught sight of the benches placed in the gravel walk in the centre of the avenue and i saw that one of them was directly opposite the house i sprang over to it and leaning over its back i could stare up at the mysterious window undisturbed yes it was she the charming maiden of my dream but her eye did not seem to seek me as i had at first thought her glance was cold and unfocused and had it not been for an occasional motion of the hand and arm i might have thought that i was looking at a cleverly painted picture i was so lost in my adoration of the mysterious being in the window so aroused and excited throughout all my nerve centres that i did not hear the shrill voice of an italian street hawker who had been offering me his wares for some time finally he touched me on the arm i turned hastily and commanded him to let me alone but he did not cease his entreaties asserting that he had earned nothing to-day and begging me to buy some small trifle from him full of impatience to get rid of him i put my hand in my pocket with the words i have more beautiful things here he opened the under drawer of his box and held out to me a little round pocket mirror in it as he held it up before my face i could see the deserted house behind me the window and the sweet face of my vision there i bought the little mirror at once for i saw that it would make it possible for me to sit comfortably and inconspicuously and yet watch the window the longer i looked at the reflection in the glass the more i fell captive to a weird and quite indescribable sensation which i might almost call a waking dream it was as if a lethargy had lamed my eyes holding them fastened on the glass beyond my power to loosen them through my mind there rushed the memory of an old nurse's tale of my earliest childhood when my nurse was taking me off to bed and i showed an inclination to stand peering into the great mirror in my father's room she would tell me that when children looked into mirrors in the night-time 
they would see a strange hideous face there and their eyes would be frozen so that they could not move them again the thought struck awe to my soul but i could not resist a peep at the mirror i was so curious to see the strange face once i did believe that i saw two hideous glowing eyes shining out of the mirror i screamed and fell down in a swoon all these foolish memories of my early childhood came trooping back to me my blood ran cold through my veins i would have thrown the mirror from me but i could not and now at last the beautiful eyes of the fair vision looked at me her glance sought mine and shone deep down into my heart the terror i had felt left me giving way to the pleasurable pain of sweetest longing you have a pretty little mirror there said a voice beside me i awoke from my dream and was not a little confused when i saw smiling faces looking at me from either side several persons had sat down upon my bench and it was quite certain that my staring into the window and my probably strange expression had afforded them great cause for amusement you have a pretty little mirror there repeated the man as i did not answer him his glance said more and asked without words the reason of my staring so oddly into the little glass he was an elderly man neatly dressed and his voice and eyes were so full of good nature that i could not refuse him my confidence i told him that i had been looking in the mirror at the picture of a beautiful maiden who was sitting at a window of the deserted house i went even farther i asked the old man if he had not seen the fair face himself over there in the old house in the last window he repeated my question in a tone of surprise yes yes i exclaimed the old man smiled and answered well well that was a strange delusion my old eyes thank heaven for my old eyes yes yes sir i saw a pretty face in the window there with my own eyes but it seemed to me to be an excellently well-painted oil portrait i turned quickly and looked toward the window there was no one there and the blind had been pulled down yes continued the old man yes sir now it is too late to make sure of the matter for just now the servant who as i know lives there alone in the house of the countess s took the picture away from the window after he had dusted it and let down the blinds was it then surely picture i asked again in bewilderment you can trust my eyes replied the old man the optical delusion was strengthened by your seeing only the reflection in the mirror and when i was in your years it was easy enough for my fancy to call up the picture of a beautiful maiden but the hand and arm moved i exclaimed oh yes they moved indeed they moved said the old man smiling as he patted me on the shoulder then he arose to go and bowing politely closed his remarks with the words beware of mirrors which can lie so vividly your obedient servant sir you can imagine how i felt when i saw that he looked upon me as a foolish phantast I began to be convinced that the old man was right, and that it was only my absurd imagination which insisted on raising up mysteries about the deserted house. I hurried home full of anger and disgust, and promised myself that I would not think of the mysterious house, and would not even walk through the avenue for several days. I kept my vow, spending my days working at my desk, and my evenings in the company of jovial friends, leaving myself no time to think of the mysteries which so enthralled me. And yet, it was just in these days that I would start up out of my sleep, as if awakened by a touch, only to find that all that had aroused me was merely the thought of that mysterious being whom I had seen in my vision and in the window of the deserted house even during my work or in the midst of a lively conversation with my friends i felt the same thought shoot through me like an electric current 
I condemned the little mirror in which I had seen the charming picture to a prosaic daily use. I placed it on my dressing table that I might bind my cravat before it, and thus it happened one day when I was about to utilize it for this important business that its glass seemed dull and that I took it up and breathed on it to rub it bright again. My heart seemed to stand still. Every fibre in me trembled in delightful awe. Yes, that is all the name I can find for the feeling that came over me, when, as my breath clouded the little mirror, I saw the beautiful face of my dreams arise and smile at me through blue mists. You laugh at me? You look upon me as an incorrigible dreamer? Think what you will about it, the fair face looked at me from out of the mirror. But as soon as the clouding vanished, the face vanished in the brightened glass. I will not weary you with a detailed recital of my sensations the next few days. I will only say that I repeated again the experiments with the mirror, sometimes with success, sometimes without. When I had not been able to call up the vision, I would run to the deserted house and stare up at the windows, but I saw no human being anywhere about the building. I lived only in the thoughts of my vision. Everything else seemed indifferent to me. I neglected my friends and my studies. The tortures in my soul passed over into, or rather mingled with, physical sensations which frightened me, and which at last made me fear for my reason. One day, after an unusually severe attack, I put my little mirror in my pocket and hurried to the home of Dr. K., who was noted for his treatment of those diseases of the mind out of which physical diseases so often grow. I told him my story. I did not conceal the slightest incident from him and I implored him to save me from the terrible fate which seemed to threaten me. He listened to me quietly, but I read astonishment in his glance. Then he said, The danger is not as near as you believe, and I think that I may say that it can be easily prevented. You are undergoing an unusual psychical disturbance beyond a doubt. But the fact that you understand that some evil principle seems to be trying to influence you gives you a weapon by which you can combat it. Leave your little mirror here with me, and force yourself to take up with some work which will afford scoop for all your mental energy. Do not go to the avenue. Work all day from early to late, then take a long walk and spend your evenings in the company of your friends. Eat heartily, and drink heavy, nourishing wines. You see, I am endeavouring to combat your fixed idea of the face in the window of the deserted house, and in the mirror, by diverting your mind to other things, and by strengthening your body. You yourself must help me in this. I was very reluctant to part with my mirror. The physician, who had already taken it, seemed to notice my hesitation. He breathed upon the glass, and holding it up to me, he asked, "'Do you see anything?' "'Nothing at all,' I answered, for so it was. "'Now breathe on the glass yourself,' said the physician, laying the mirror in my hands. I did as he requested. There was the vision even more clearly than ever before. "'There she is!' I cried aloud. The physician looked into the glass, and then said, "'I cannot see anything, but I will confess to you that when I looked into this glass a queer shiver overcame me, passing away almost at once. Now do it once more.' I breathed upon the glass again, and the physician laid his hand upon the back of my neck. The face appeared again, and the physician, looking into the mirror over my shoulder, turned pale. Then he took the little glass from my hands, looked at it attentively, and locked it into his desk, returning to me after a few moments' silent thought. "'Follow my instructions strictly,' he said. "'I must confess to you that I do not yet understand those moments of your vision, but I hope to be able to tell you more about it 
very soon. End of section 12 Read by Lars Rolander